not going anywhere for a while grab a Snickers here we go now good morning everyone uh, it is an honor and privilege as always to uh, stand before you in this pulpit and open the Word of God together. I uh, appreciate Pastor giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, at times, I'm sure, uh, I'm actually almost surprised he answers the phone when he sees my name on the caller ID. We've certainly had some interesting discussions, but I've had a lot of things on my heart and wanted to share some of those with you this morning. And hopefully, um, I don't know, that last song was really appropriate. I hope that what we look at today will challenge you but also strengthen you with everything that's going on around us today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Psalm 91. But while you're turning there, uh, think back in your mind kind of to the world as it was back in January and February of this year. If you're like me, probably like everybody, what we thought 2020 was going to be like uh, ended up a little bit differently than what we were thinking back then. A lot has happened uh, over the last five months, you know, and I was looking back at a lot of stuff and thinking, I was like, it was less than three weeks after Mr. Lovell's funeral, you know, where we, I believe, broke the all-time record for the number of people we had in this building at one time. That pastor was preaching to just Dwayne in an empty building in a video camera, so... Uh, again, life the way it looked five months ago is almost like a distant memory. It also feels, though, to me, in many respects, uh, that in a very short amount of time, almost every facet of life has become a battlefield. Um, the couple of things that, that just come to my mind, did you ever think that you would live to see a day in the United States of America where the government was threatening to shut off the power and water to churches, or that pastors would face monetary fines and threats of jail time for holding service. That's actually going on in some places right now. We talked a little bit about that some last Sunday night. Did you think you would ever live to see a day when evangelical churches would shut down for months on end, some already having announced for the rest of the year that they won't hold service in the face of a virus that, as of yesterday, Johns Hopkins says shows a mortality rate of 49.32 per 100,000 people, which if you get a calculator, that's about a 99.95% survival rate. You know, it's kind of hard to look at youth and tell them to go risk their lives overseas for the gospel when we've got a virus that is keeping people out of church with that high of a survival rate. Not that we shouldn't be cautious, but that we shouldn't be fearful. Uh, one of the things I'll say there is I really am thankful for this church and how we've really tried to navigate some of this. We've tried to balance the caution that we need to take, but not act out of fear. You know, act out of prudence and concern for our neighbors, but not out of fear. And I think there's a big difference there. But did you ever think you would see a day when rioters and looters would take over parts of cities and those in government with a sworn duty to protect citizenry would just stand by and do nothing or worse actually publicly come out and support lawlessness it's crazy did you ever think you would live to see a day where a gallup poll in the united states would come back showing that nearly four in ten people in this country supported some form of socialism as a side note, I'd encourage you to go do a little research on socialism and just see how many of the Ten Commandments you can find that socialist beliefs violate. That, that'll be an interesting study. You might be surprised what you learn. But indeed, brothers and sisters, we're living in the midst of some raging battles, some seen, some unseen. But these battles did not just start or ignite when coronavirus showed up at our doorstep earlier this year. Many of these have been raging for a long, long time. Um, and they will continue to rage in different forms until Christ's return. It's not enough, though, for us to simply recognize that there's a battle going on. It's kind of like the elephant in the room. As Christians, we must be engaged in the battle. And to be prepared to be engaged, we need a source of strength that's greater than our own. You know, I, again, I was thinking as believers blessed to live in America, I think we're moving into a period of time that perhaps we naively thought would never come. 
a time when holding the line for Christ will come with a threat right here at home. The threat of broken relationships, the th perhaps even the threat of personal loss financially or even physically. Um, you know, we looked at what John MacArthur's church was doing last Sunday night, and he was commenting uh, last year in a chapel sermon, funny enough, before any of this started, uh, speaking to his seminary students, that one of the most difficult things he has endured as a pastor is the loss of relationships and friendships as he has held the line on his convictions and others kind of fell away. They didn't stand with him. It's getting lonelier and lonelier. Certainly over the past two weeks, I think we could say that he, for example, is experiencing that again to a large degree. Um, as far as I'm aware, only a handful of well-known Southern Baptists have come out and said anything publicly to support him in what he's doing. Um, you know, our current SBC leadership largely remains silent. But then again, maybe we aren't hearing from them because in many cases they aren't even holding church themselves until next year. For believers in the church in general throughout history, though, persecution is and has been the norm. Uh, for us in America, it's almost as if we can't believe it could actually be. We begin looking at the sky like, is the rapture coming? Is it time? Maybe it will be. Can't say it's not. Certainly, we're to remain ever hopeful for Christ's return. And certainly, there are plenty of signs indicating that the day of the Lord is drawing near. But what if, what if, instead, we're being called at this time to stand up as Christian soldiers and jump into the fray? Our call to arms as believers is not just intended for week-long missions trips, only to come back to the comfort of our homes and the safe freedoms we've always enjoyed here in America, maybe the America of yesterday. It's a call to make war every single day. What if God is allowing some of these things to happen, this new normal, as I keep hearing it called, to separate the real Christians from the posers, to push us off the bench and into the game? If He is doing that, how do we find the strength to do this? How do we properly respond to what is going on in the world around us? I want to take a few minutes here this morning and pull three key truths from a really awesome psalm. It's Psalm 91. Some of these truths as I was studying this to me were convicting. Others were very encouraging. But my prayer this morning is that this psalm right here will be a source of strength to you. A motivation to really refocus on your relationship with the Lord. If you would, stand with me briefly uh, for the reading of God's Word. We'll start this in prayer. Psalm 91, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning, and we just ask, Lord, for Lord, peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we ask for 
unity and strength around your word during times that are troubling and perhaps concerning on many levels. Lord, I pray your blessing on each one here. Lord, I pray your blessing on this church and this state and this land. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see what a, what a great refuge you are in time of need this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. When I read this, I was really moved personally by the promise that was in this psalm. I read this and I was like, man, this is exactly what I needed to hear from the Lord, that God will be a refuge. I love the description of God's protection in the first four verses of this chapter. What an incredibly beautiful promise and of blessing to believers. But there is a caveat in those first four verses, and it's an important one. The promise of refuge is to those who believe in the Lord, but not all who believe. It's a promise to those believers who, look again at verse 1, dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Well, what does that mean? Well, the language here implies that the promises of this psalm are made to believers who continually and constantly strive to maintain a close relationship with God. Over and over throughout the book of Psalms, God is portrayed as a refuge. He is portrayed as a God who can be trusted. I'll give you some examples. Um, psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 144, verse 2 says, My loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge. Psalm 56, 3, Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Some really awesome things throughout the Psalms describing God as a refuge in time of trouble, as somebody who can be trusted each and every time. But none of these amazing verses are very much comfort unless we can honestly say ourselves that we have them for ourselves. So for example, I can know that God is a refuge and I can know that God is a fortress, but is he my refuge? Is he my fortress? Am I placing my trust in him? It's, it's like we talk about pastor shares all the time. It's one thing to know, it's another thing to live it and believe it in our hearts. This gets to the heart of the first thing that I want us all to see this morning. The need for us to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. The promise of refuge and protection are for those believers who are in constant fellowship with Christ. Christ is that secret place. That secret place of the Most High. How do we do that? How do we have that kind of fellowship with Christ? Well... Two ways I can think of right now. Time spent in His Word and prayer. Um, if you watched any of the YouTube videos while we were not able to meet normally on Wednesday nights, we spent several weeks going through prayer. And I hope that was helpful to those of you who could watch it. Um, it was something that had kind of been on my mind. But spending time in prayer every day with the Lord is so important. It gives us a chance to do a number of things which grow a relationship. We can express gratitude and thankfulness to God for the things that He's done in our lives and the things that, that He provides. First Chronicles 16.34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endures forever. God's goodness, mercy, and kindness towards us should not go overlooked even for a single day. If you look back at your life, you will see His hand on it if you belong to Him. Prayer also gives us an opportunity to confess our sins and talk to God about times when we know we've fallen short. And we do it every day. We fail every day. God knows this already, but He desires to hear us talk to Him and express our sadness and our disgust at what we know we did wrong. When we're burdened by things in our lives that we know aren't right, one of the most therapeutic things we can do is to come clean before God in prayer. Psalm 32, 5 says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. God will give us strength to repent 
and pick ourselves back up and be ready to withstand the enemy again if we just go to him in prayer and ask him. And like I said, in all these ways, prayer is a primary method of sharing our lives with the Lord. Can you imagine having a relationship with anybody and not talking to them? I mean, can you imagine being married to someone and not sharing your life with them? I'm gone a lot for work, but Jeans and I are usually on the same page. <laughs> but seriously, can you... How do you get to know someone beyond the surface without sharing your dreams, hopes, aspirations, struggles, failures, your, your wants for the future, all those things? James 4.8 reminds us, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. God wants uh, to know us. He wants us to know Him through His Word and through prayer. Um, Circumstances can, as we've seen, change in a moment's notice. How much better equipped will we be if we're already in the habits, in the good times, um, of going to God daily in prayer? If we're already talking to Him, we're already in tune with Him, you know, it will be that much easier in the good times and in the bad. Verse 4, back in Psalm 91 his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. What is God's truth? It's His Word. When Christ was tempted in Matthew, what was His defense? It was the Word of God. Christ Himself said in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. So how do we abide in Christ, the secret place of the Most High? We do it through constant prayer and the diligent study of His Word and application of it in our lives. The second key thing I want to draw out of this psalm comes as a result of abiding in Him. It comes as a result of the first thing. Starting in verse 5, it says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. For those that are abiding in Christ, there is no need to fear. We can be concerned. We can be upset about things. And I, we can be. I mean, you ask Pastor. I have been. I'm sure y'all have been at, at other points too. That's not always bad. But fear is not something that we should be characterized. One of the neat things looking at verse 5 and 6 is he's naming these four things. Well, if you're a Hebrew living back in the day, you probably would have divided your day up into four sections. 6 p.m. to midnight was evening. 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. was your night or midnight. Then 6 a.m. to noon was morning. And noon to 6 p.m. was your afternoon or midday. Well, if you look in those verses, all those are covered. So basically what's being implied there is that the entire day is covered. If you abide in Christ, if we abide in Christ, we have no need to fear 24 hours a day. The whole time is covered. I have to be very honest with you. One of the things that has bothered me the most during the last five months is the amount of fear that I have noticed in people. As believers, like I said, we should not be characterized by fear. We can be cautious, and by all means, we should be. But we should not be fearful. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So instead of fear, we should be characterized by love, peace, steadfastness in the face of trials. We should kind of be stable in the face of adversity. Trust me, if we can be, especially when you're in the workplace, for example, you'll get a lot of opportunities to witness because people will ask about how you are. In Colossians 3.15, we're told that believers are to let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Letting the peace of God rule in our hearts means that we're trusting Him. We're trusting His promises. We're trusting that He really will be the refuge that He promises to be. We're not to be, as believers, a people of panic. We're to be a people of faith. Uh, if you remember a long time ago, some of you came to a home Bible study at my house. We did, went through the Truth Project. Well, the slogan of the Truth Project was, Do you really believe that what you say you believe is really real? 
If we do, that's going to have a big impact on our lives. And in this case, it's going to result in peace instead of fear. Consider also the fruits of the Spirit, the characteristics that should describe every believer that has God's Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Love, joy, and peace. If we are allowing the Spirit of God to rule in our hearts and lives, we will experience His peace instead of fear. Paul also reminds us in Romans 8, 6, Romans 8, 6 that to be spiritually minded is life and peace. An example that always comes to mind uh, when, when I think about these things is Stonewall Jackson. Um, JR and I drove up to Charlottesville a few weeks back to take some pictures of the monuments there because we're kind of figured maybe they'll get taken down. Uh, and Stonewall Jackson is one of them over near the Albemarle County Courthouse. And on the front of his monument, there are two angels inscribed in that monument. One represents faith and the other represents valor. These two things really characterize Jackson, but he would not have had one without the other. And that's really important. Consider a little snippet of Virginia history, a um, little story that I've read many times. After the Battle of Manassas, Captain John Daniel Imboden called upon General Stonewall Jackson, who was severely wounded, and found him bathing his swollen hand in spring water, bearing his pain very patiently. In the course of their conversation, Imboden said, How is it, General, you can keep so cool? and appear so utterly insensible to danger in the storm of shells and bullets as rained about you when your hand was hit. He instantly became grave and reverential in his manner, and he answered in a low tone of earnestness, Captain, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time of my death. I do not concern myself about that, but to be always ready, no matter when it may overtake me. He added after a pause, Captain, that is the way all men should live, and then all would be equally brave. Those are pretty powerful words. Those who trust in God can live fearlessly. It doesn't mean that we won't be faced with difficult things in our lives. It doesn't mean that literally we'll never get sick, or that literally we'll never struggle. But what it does mean is that nothing can touch us that has not gone through God's hands. We have no need to be fearful because God really is our refuge. When he says that, he means it. What it means is that we can go through the very valley of the shadow of death and do it without fear. Verses 7 and 8. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. There is a direct relationship here between placing our faith in Christ and having the confidence to face the hardships that we are promised will come in this life. Verses 9 and 10, Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Because we abide in the Lord, no evil shall befall us. And verses 11 through 13 give us even more insight into that. Or 11 through 12, I'm sorry. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. These verses, it's interesting to note, were the ones that were misquoted by Satan when he was tempting Jesus in Matthew. They're a little side note for Wednesday night. Satan knows this passage really well, and he knew it applied to Jesus. He left out the words in all your ways, if you were curious. That makes a big difference in how, what that passage means when you take those out. Going back to this, if we make our abode with Christ, if we trust Him continually, we enjoy the constant care of His angels. Not just one angel, but angels, plural. Listen to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It says, But to which of the angels has He, speaking of Christ, ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? How awesome is that? How comforting is that? 
I hope that you can see the strength that we can draw out of a passage like Psalm 91. This is like nourishment to a scared, starving spirit. But there's more. We're not done yet. Verse 13. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. This idea of trampling something underfoot or treading underfoot is symbolic of having a complete victory. Immediately when I read this, I was like, okay, think the Virginia flag. What is on our Virginia flag inside the little seal? It's Virtus standing there with her foot on top of tyranny. He's totally defeated. Same idea here. The lion and the cobra are two very different foes. The lion, picture that as things in your life that are large and visible and maybe even corporate. Maybe the, the lions are things that we might face together as a church. The cobra, mm, that's more secret and cunning. Maybe those are things that you struggle with that others don't even see. We deal with big things in life and we deal with personal struggles, sometimes both at the same time. Interesting to note here again that both the image of a lion and the image of a, certain, a serpent are used at times in scriptures to represent Satan. The repetition here, though, is figurative of the believer's ability to overcome even the most dreadful types of adversity in both arenas, the visible public square and the personal private square. None of them are a match for the Holy Spirit, for God's ministering spirits in each one of our lives. I give you one other passage to ponder that kind of gives a good contrast here in regards to fear. Hold your place in Psalm 91 for just a second and flip over to Matthew chapter 28. The Bible here presents two very different results of the miracle of Christ's resurrection. I had never really thought about this before I studied this kind of one of those things that's there and I had glossed over it. It says in Matthew 28, starting in verse 1, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. So in verse 4, it's basically this is a contrast of two types of fear. The guards were so scared that they passed out and fell to the ground like dead men. Did the angels pick them up? Nope. Just let them lay there. But in verse 5, the angels did just the opposite for the women. They told them, do not be afraid. With the women, God took away their fear and replaced it with reverence and awe, which is the fear in verse 8, the fear of the Lord, and joy. With the guards, God allowed their fear to completely overwhelm them. It's a glaring example. Never even noticed it before until I, until I studied for this. Of belief versus unbelief, of trust in God versus no trust in God. What can fear do? The third and final thing that I would really like to leave you with from this psalm, Psalm 91, is the importance of setting our love upon Christ. What does it mean to love God? It means a lot of things. As before, all the precepts that we talked about build on one another. Abide in Christ. Do not fear. But to love God, you have to know Him. Just as we've discussed, we know Him through His Word. We know Him through prayer, through abiding in Him. 
To love God is to put Him first in everything. Mark 12, 30 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first commandment. To love God is to desire Him. To desire His righteousness. To desire His Word even more every day. We sing a song about how the deer pants for the water from Psalm 42, verse 1. That's, that's really the right comparison. That's how we're supposed to look at His Word. To love God is to obey Him, not legalistically, but as a natural living out of His Word being written on our hearts. 1 John chapter 2 says, now by, this that we, now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in Him. He who says He abides in Him ought Himself to walk just as He walked. Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Look at what happens when we take that attitude. Look at what happens when we do this. Back in Psalm 91, in these last few verses, there's a switch here in verse 14. The person who's talking changes in verse 14. It's no longer the psalmist. It's now God Himself answering back. This is God speaking. He says, because, talking about the person who's done all the things before and is taking refuge in God, because this person, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. That's pretty cool to see the Lord take that response. And again, remember that these words are not being spoken to those who ignore God on a normal day and then cry to Him when their ship hits the shoals. This is the ones that are in fellowship with God constantly, that set their love upon Him, that abide in Him that trust in Him so they don't fear their overcoming fear. This is how God responds to that. I don't know about you, but that's hugely motivating for me personally to strive for a closer relationship to God. What an awesome promise that when I am in times of trouble, He will be with me, that He will deliver me because we haven't even been apart. We're together already. We're spending time together anyway, every day. So as we come to the end of this psalm, let's look briefly at verse 16. It says, With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. For God to show us his salvation is something a whole lot bigger than just like today. It's, there is comfort, obviously, in the Lord for today. And there's things that he blesses us with and helps us with today. But to see the salvation of God is really huge. It's, it's to know the depth of what Paul was writing about in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, when he says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Pretty awesome. The Lord will show us that. So this morning, I hope that looking into the words of this psalm, will bring every one of us fresh strength and fresh resolve in the face of what's going on in the world around us right now. I pray that each one of us will redouble our efforts to be faithful every day, to be in the Word of God, to pray to Him. I pray that we will keep our eyes open, that we will be really a lot more attentive where we, where we haven't been before to the battles that are raging around us and that we'll get up and get motivated every day to put on the armor of God and suit up for battle. You know, not doing what we can to avoid the battle, but doing what we can to be ready to dive in when we see the opportunity. As I close, I want to leave you with a little picture and a little poem, so to speak. As you all know, my favorite book is Pilgrim's Progress. I'm always remembering something out of there. But there is a really awesome picture that is given near the beginning of the book.
Christian goes to the house of the interpreter, which is the Holy Spirit, and he's showing him these pictures that he's supposed to take with him and remember in his mind to help him in certain situations that the Holy Spirit knew he would encounter. I'll just read. It's just two paragraphs here. It says, Then I saw in my dream that the interpreter took Christian by the hand and led him into a place where there was a fire burning next to a wall. Standing by the wall was an individual who was continually throwing water on the fire to put it out. Yet the fire just burned higher and hotter. Christian asked, well, what does this mean? The interpreter answered, this fire is the work of grace working in the heart. He who throws water on it to extinguish it and put it out is the devil. But as you see, the fire is burning higher and hotter in spite of it. You'll be shown the reason for that. And with that, he took Christian around to the other side of the wall. He couldn't see before. When they walked around behind the wall, he saw a man with a jar of oil in his hand, continually and secretly pouring oil upon the fire. Again, Christian asked, what does this mean? The interpreter explained, this is Christ, who continually maintains the work already begun in the heart by applying the oil of his grace. Because of this, the souls of his people remain full of grace in spite of what the devil can do. In that you saw the man standing behind the wall to keep the fire burning, that's meant to teach you that it's hard for those tempted to see how this work of grace is continued in the soul. It can definitely be hard to see Christ's hand sometimes, but it's there. The fire will keep burning because Christ's grace is unlimited. And then I want to leave you with just a little quote from Charles Wesley. O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle the flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze, and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and stir up thy gift in me. May we all leave this place and dwell in the secret place of the Most High, Christ Jesus.